Romans 10. Look at that first verse, verse 13. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that the coolest scripture? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It didn't say whoever has it all together. It didn't say whoever's good enough. It didn't say whoever's educated or who's rich enough or who's just the perfect person. It just simply said whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the greatest promise given to the world. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then it starts asking some questions. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? Well, that makes sense. How are they going to believe in him whom they have not heard? That makes sense. How are they going to hear without a person to speak? Now, I know the regular verse says a preacher, but when people see that word preacher, they think of some person that does something professionally, when really it means someone to speak. How are they going to hear without someone that's going to speak to them? Now, as soon as we start talking about Friend Day on September 30th, and as soon as we start talking about things like evangelism, right, people start getting all weirded out. They start thinking, oh man, I know what you want me to do, Pastor. You're expecting me to stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, you, you know, just like, just like I'm, I'm a little bit different this morning, right? I mean, well, well, not that much, but I mean, you know, for normal people, for no, you know, it, it's like, you know, they, you know, I got like a glow, like a neon sign. You want me to get out there? You want me to show up? You want me to stand out? You want me to act like some kind of, you know, weirdo Jesus freak? And, and, that, and I'm just not into that at all. As soon as we start talking about evangelism, that's what people think. They think, man, you want me to you know, kind of like go around glowing and be somebody that nobody wants to be in a room around. And so I want to talk a little bit about the self-talk that goes on in your head when you hear the word evangelism. Because right off, people start thinking things like, well, I don't have enough confidence to do that kind of stuff. I don't have the skills to do that kind of stuff. My mind isn't quick enough to respond to whatever people might push back on me with. I'm really not that kind of a relational person. And they start thinking all of these things. And I want to attack and replace all of these fallacies with some truth this morning. Is that okay? I don't want you to, you know think that you've got to become some kind of neon billboard and some kind of Jesus freak weirdo. That's not what we're talking about. As a matter of fact, i got to get out of this because it's like 900 degrees in here. And I'm like, whew. I'm like dying here. Oh my goodness. These illustrations. You know. Not like I... Uh, you are a bunch of weirdos and a bunch of sickos. something wrong with your heads okay (laughs) listen here's the truth only 10 percent only 10 percent of any congregation ever shares their faith in christ and there's four reasons for that and i'm just going to quickly touch on them this morning number one is apathy or indifference that people are just apathetic or they're indifference and i really believe that the only way a person can be apathetic is that their minds have never really come to grip with scriptures like this. Matthew 25, 41, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Are you kidding me? He didn't say to those on his left who were pimps. He didn't say to those on his left who were, who were you know, drug dealers or murderers or rapists. He just said he's going to say to those people who have not believed in him, good, bad, and ugly, depart from me into everlasting fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. It goes on into verse 46 and it says, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You see, there's no way we can be apathetic with the realization of what the Bible preaches about the subject of hell. Do you know, I think out of the 26 times hell is mentioned in the New Testament, Jesus is the one who talks about it 22 out of the 26 times. And, you know, and, and, and it's an eternal thing. It's an eternal place. We don't want to hear that today. It's not politically relevant. It's not correct. It's like not tolerant. It's like, ooh, you know. And yet the fact is what the fact is. The truth is what the truth is. Jesus said, those on the left will depart from me into eternal torment, into eternal flames, and they will be punished forever. And there's no way we could be apathetic if we could get the truth of that into our souls. 
Mahatma Gandhi said, if I really believed what the Bible says about the subject of hell, I would wear my legs down to bloody stumps traveling the world telling people to avoid such a place. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, if I only had 12 people that I could hang over the fires of hell for one minute, I could take those 12 people and revolutionize the world. If we had a revelation of what hell was really like. You know, there are no unbelievers in hell, is there? You know, people say, well, I'm an atheist, I'm an agnostic. You won't be. Not for, all, not for long. Jesus tells a parable about the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man dies and goes into hell, and the minute his feet hit the flames, bam, he becomes an evangelist. He says, Abraham, please let me go to my brothers that I might warn them not to come into this place. There are no unbelievers in hell. They become immediate evangelists, but guess what? They can't do it then, it's too late. And so it's impossible for us as the church to be apathetic in light of the scriptural teaching of this place of torment, this place of eternal separation from the goodness of God and the love of Jesus Christ, this place called hell. It's impossible. Secondly, our wrong beliefs. This is the second thing that kind of keeps people from sharing their faith. Wrong beliefs. You know, we got the the belief that the immorality... And the violence of our society is due to uh, uh, you know, poverty or social injustice or even genetics. And yet the Bible is clear that no, there is this thing called sin in the world. And sin makes people do what sin makes people do. And people act not because of their location or their society or their education or lack of it or poverty, the fact that they're from the ghetto or whatever. Because you can have people in Enron, CEOs, who sin against God and sin against people. And they're not from the ghetto. They're multimillionaires, right? So sin doesn't know any economic status. Sin doesn't know any educational status. Sin is a blight on the human race. I've sinned. I'll probably sin before I'm done this day. You've sinned. You'll probably sin before I'm done this sermon. You know, (laughs) Mother Teresa's sin, Billy Graham's sin, the Pope's sin, everybody's sinned. The Bible's very explicit about it. In Romans chapter 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we have these wrong beliefs. That, well, you know, it's just people's upbringing. If we educated people and if we gave them a chance and a leg up in life, they'd be much better. No, baloney. That doesn't happen. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, I remember seeing pictures because sin brings guilt. And people live under this tremendous weight of guilt. I've seen pictures of, of, of people who have been deceived in false religions with flesh hooks in their back, chained to big wagons filled with rocks, and they march through the streets, pulling these things, pulling their flesh out like this, like it's a tent of some kind, as they're trying to appease whatever God they serve because of the guilt that they experience. I read this great, uh, it was actually a funny book, but I read this and it wasn't really funny. It's what this guy said. He goes, when I was in second grade, I remember watching a fifth grader fall apart at the ice cream bar. The problem we faced was that the hot dog bar was right next to it. While I was waiting in line watching him take a big bowl of pristine white soft serve vanilla ice cream and approach the first condiment dispenser, he pressed down as hard as he could and out came a serving of mustard. It was all over his ice cream and he looked down at it with complete and utter devastation. I felt bad for him, but out of nowhere a Chuck E. Cheese employee jumped right in and said, hey that's okay kid, here's a new bowl of ice cream. I'll never forget that little boy's face as he looked up at the employee and down in his ruined bowl of ice cream. He was so ashamed at what he had done. He was so embarrassed that he had put mustard all over that ice cream and he paused and he told the employee, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's okay. It's not that big of a deal, I'm fine. And then he started to stir the mustard into the ice cream. He tried as hard as he could to mix that bright yellow mustard into a bright white vanilla ice cream. And finally, it all became this pale emo yellow colored mush. He looked back up and then he returned to his table, presumably to choke the ice cream down. How many people make a mess of their lives and just try to stir harder? 
How many people are just trying to stir harder? I can, I can just make this better. I'm just going to stir harder. I, I, I'm, just, I'm guilty, and I know I'm guilty, but I think if I stir harder, somehow it'll all work out. Somehow I'll be able to feel better, and it doesn't happen that way. It's the difference between works and the grace of God. It's the difference between earning something and receiving something. It's the difference between trying and trusting. You see, with God, it's all about trusting and receiving His grace. We move on from apathy. We can't be apathetic as people who are called to share our faith. We can't be uh, having wrong beliefs. And thirdly, pluralism. Now, if you weren't here last week, well, shame on you. No, if you weren't here last week, I kid you, I preach, I preach one of the best messages I've preached in a week. Uh, you know, well, thanks. All the other weeks was just toast and cereal, Pastor, but that, no. No, I got to admit, it was, it was about pluralism. And if you were not here and you did not see it, I want you to go online, newliferaymond.com, go on our website, and I, I can't remember if we called it the new gate or pluralism, but it's one of those, and go and watch that, because I talk about the subject of pluralism, how pluralism and tolerance creeps into the church, and it says, listen, all religious beliefs are equal, and don't go rocking the boat, let people just believe what they want to believe, and it chokes the, the, the desire to evangelize, because we don't want to be seen as people who are politically incorrect, we don't want to be seen as people who are rocking the boat. You know what, I hate to say this, but Jesus is the only way. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by through me. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. And he knows what he's talking about. He's the only one that came down from heaven, lived among us, died, gave his life for us, ascended back into heaven. I think he's got the corner on truth. And he said, this is the absolute truth. If you didn't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on pluralism. If you didn't hear that message, go online and listen to that message. The other scripture is in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which has been given among men, by which we must be saved. He's saying there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. You can't be saved by Muhammad. You can't be saved by Buddha. You can't be saved by Confucius. You can't be saved by the Reverend Moon. It's only in Jesus. And so we can't have this thing of pluralism. But lastly, out of the four things, the one that I want to address the most that holds people back from sharing their faith. It's not even apathy. It's not even wrong beliefs. It's not even pluralism. But it is a lack of of confidence you'll have to agree with me this morning when the holy spirit moves on you and says i want you to tell somebody else about jesus your knees start shaking your voice starts crackling like you're going through puberty all over again you know what i'm saying you start getting really nervous and people have a lack of common confidence they feel intimidated they feel inadequate they feel fearful and this is what i want to address this morning because i've got some good news for you the power of the gospel is not in the messenger, it's in the message. If you don't take anything else out of this sermon, take this. The power of the gospel is not in the messenger that I have to glow like a neon sign. The, God, the power of the gospel is not in the messenger, it's in the message. I've got a life jacket I don't have to draw attention. As a matter of fact, I don't want to draw attention to myself. I don't want people looking too closely at me because then they'll say, you're a Christian. I've got a message, and the message is all I have to throw out there. The power of the gospel is not in the messenger. It's in the message that you share. Look what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. He said, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, so for my part, I'm eager to preach, and that just means to speak the gospel to you who are also in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, everybody say for it. for it, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is emphatic here, he says it's not about my preaching, it's not about the messenger, it's about the message, for it is the power of salvation. It is what works in the lives of people. The power of the gospel is not in the messenger. It is in the message. 
It's not in the rain suit. It's in the life jacket. Paul goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. You know what Paul is saying there? First of all, he's saying two things. He's saying what, which is the message, and he's saying how, which is the power. And he's saying that the power of the gospel is not in the messenger, it's in the message. And so look at what he says, our gospel. What is it that we're sharing? Well, it's the gospel. It's the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. We saw that in the very first verse of the sermon. Whoever calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved. Isn't that good news? See, the focus is on Jesus. It's all, you know, Paul used to go into different villages and towns and cities, and he says, I don't want to know anything among any of you except Christ and him crucified. I'm preaching Jesus. I'm not preaching how you can grow a church through a bus ministry. I don't want to preach about how you need to have a women's ministry or men's ministry. It's about Jesus. The message is Jesus loves sinners and he came to save them. To save them from hell and to bring them from heaven. The message is Jesus crucified, resurrected, ascended, and coming again. And he is the only solution for sin. Look what John said in 1 John 5. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. You can't get any cut and dry than that. That is as black and white as it can be. If you've got the Son, you've got eternal life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have eternal life. Well, I don't believe in that stuff. Then you don't have eternal life. It's not a big issue. We don't have to argue. We don't have to fight about it. It is what it is. It all depends whether you want life and whether you're humble enough to come God's way. It's a really simple message. Jesus loves people. Jesus loves the prostitutes. Jesus loves the gays. Jesus loves the adulterers. Jesus loves the Enron uh, CEOs. Jesus loves the people who does the Ponzi schemes. Jesus loves sinners. Jesus loves people. And he doesn't want them to go to hell for their stupidity. He wants them to go to heaven. And so the message, do you want to know how simple the message is? This message is as simple as seven words. Though I was blind, now I see. You remember the story about the blind guy? Jesus heals the blind guy. Then all the Pharisees, all the religious people start coming down on him to find out what his theology is, to find out what his background is, to find out what the skinny is. And he says, listen, all I know is I was blind, and now I'm seeing. That's the message. Hey, all I know is I was once lost as a goose in a snowstorm, and Jesus saved me. That's how simple the message is. I got good news. Jesus did this for me. I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. I was, oh, you wouldn't believe the things that I was into. And Jesus saved me. Jesus changed me. The transformative power of the gospel is unheralded by any, it's not matched by any other thing out there. Jesus began to change my life. And he can do the same for you. You know what C.S. Lewis said? This is great. If you want to write something down, this is great. C.S. Lewis said this. I believe in Jesus the same way I believe in the sun. I believe in the sun because I can see it up in the sky, but also by it, I can see everything else because it's light that gives us vision. I believe in Jesus because I can sense him and taste and see that he is good, and through him, I see everything else in perfect clarity. All of life, all of a sudden, makes perfect sense. Jesus centers me in truth, spiritual truth, historical truth, scientific truth. You know, it doesn't matter. Jesus centers us in truth. So the message is really simple. The message is just about Jesus. And he says the how of that is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that word power just simply means ability. Ability. Jesus gives me the ability, the Holy Spirit gives me the ability to communicate things that I could otherwise communicate. Why? Because it's not about me, it's about the message. It's not my ability. It's not your ability. 
Years ago, there was a guy that was attending this church, and his wife was praying for him because he wasn't saved, and his kids were praying for him because he wasn't saved, and uh, he, he wouldn't come to church or anything, and, uh, but he would go hunting. And so I kind of got a relationship with this guy uh, through hunting and things like that, and, and I knew he was kind of like into you know, sci-fi and you know, uh, uh, action movies and things like that. So a day came when I called him up and I said, hey, there's this movie coming out, Jurassic Park, you know, dinosaurs eating people. How cool is that? How, you know, you want to go see that? And he was like, sure, I'll go see it. I said, I'll pay your way. I'll pay for you. Let's go see it. We drove all the way to Manchester. We sat there. How, you, how many have seen Jurassic Park? You know, I mean, how cool is that? Dinosaurs eating people. I mean, come on. You know, it's just absolutely awesome. And uh, so, you know, we watched the whole movie, and, um, and, and we got back in the car, and we're just driving back to Raymond from, from Manchester. And it wasn't me. Something just came over me, and I just looked at him, and I said, if a dinosaur were to eat you tonight, where would you go? <laughs> you know what? I mean, it's like, it's like, that is like so lame, right? I mean, that's like just ridiculous. It's so random. It's just like, uh, you know, and he sat there and he says, you know, I, I don't know. And I shared the message of Jesus Christ with him, and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ in the car coming back from seeing Jurassic Park. That's awesome. It's not. It's so easy when you trust the Lord. Why? Because it's not in the messenger. It's in the message. Look what Paul said here in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Listen, let this forever establish in your heart that the power is not in the messenger, it's in the message. Because in the Greek, there's some interesting things that unfold in the Greek here. When Paul says, I planted, it is a specific period of time that he's talking about in the Greek. I planted and then I was done. When he talks about Apollos came by and watered, in the Greek, it's a specific period time in history that apollos watered and then it was done but when it talks about and god caused the growth there is a overlapping work that god was in the thing from before the beginning to after the end in other words paul was planting apollos was watering but god was working before they planted before they watered and after they planted and after they watered and god was the one that was doing the work in the heart because he's not talking about corn here is he? he's talking about planting the gospel in a people's lives and watering it by repetitive you know reminders that hey you're going to live forever, man. You're an eternal being, and you will live forever either with Christ or without Him. And he says that God was working in the scene from beginning to end over the whole thing God was working in that person's life. You know, years ago, when we attended a different church in Portsmouth, um, there was this young guy, a good-looking guy, very athletic guy, and he had an evangelistic ministry of dating. I kid you not. Now, I don't, I don't recommend this for anybody because, you know, you, know, you don't want to be unequally yoked type thing. If you're a Christian, you want to go with a Christian, you know, this kind of thing. And this guy would go out to, to dance halls or whatever, and he'd meet these breathtakingly beautiful girls, and every week he's bringing a different girl to church, and she's sitting there, and then it's like, you know, he's done, and he's off, you know, meeting somebody else. Now, I, I don't recommend that, you know. It was kind of a cheesy thing to do, but he was successful at it. I mean, he was just good at it. In one, one week, he came in with this girl, and she was just, she was, a, she was an aerobics teacher. You know, I mean, just, you know, beautiful, long, dark hair. And, and he brought her to church, and she came to church. I was the minister of uh, visitation and follow-up and stuff like that. So I called her up. I set an appointment for her to come in my office, and we started talking, and I found out that she was Jewish. And immediately, I started getting all excited. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're Jewish? I said, you're a descendant of Abraham. And she's like, I am. I'm like, you know, you, you know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, you're, you're one of God's chosen people that he worked through with, throughout history. You're Jewish. That's awesome. And the next thing you know, she's like getting all excited about, yeah, I'm Jewish, you know? How cool is that? And I'm like, this is awesome. And then I just looked at her and I said, and Jesus is your promised Messiah. 
He says, here you are in a Gentile church hearing about that the fulfillment of your ancestry and your lineage is in Jesus. And he lets us Gentiles in too. Isn't that pretty cool? And she was like, wow, 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 wow. And I said, have you ever asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord, your Savior, your Messiah? No. And we prayed. And she asked Jesus in her heart too. Because, because it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. She got excited about the fact that Jesus loved her as a Jew and that he had a purpose and a plan for her life. She got all excited. It's not Paul who's planting. It's not about Paul who's watering. But God is doing a continual work through the whole process. Look at this scripture. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless what? Unless the Father who sent me draws him. What's that talking about? That's talking about that there is a divine agency that's in the work of people's lives without you and I ever knowing it. I mean, I don't, you know, as a teenager, I can, I can vividly remember as a teenager, there was a time where I became spiritually hungry to know about God. And how could I believe and how could I hear unless somebody spoke to me? And nobody did. And then later on, in my, in my late teens, again, there was a season when I became really, really hungry to know about God. See, I was raised Catholic, but I didn't know what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus. And I remember we were foam-insulating buildings. I was in a job where we would foam-insulate buildings, and uh, we were over here foam-insulating a building, and there were a couple of masons over there laying the brick, and we were filling them as they were putting them down. And this one guy was witnessing to another guy. And man, I was like straining my ear to hear what was being said because I was so hungry, but nobody told me. And then I fell, and then I got into a life of alcoholism and drug addiction and everything else, and I could have, saved, I could have been saved from all of that if somebody had told me when God was working in my heart. But see, then I got into the drugs and the alcohol, and I shut that door because then I was just angry, and I didn't want nothing to do with that. I was just medicating myself. Until finally, full circle, the connection was made and somebody spoke to me when I was hungry again. And I gave my life to Jesus. You know, the power is not in the messenger. The power is in the message. He's saying, how can somebody come unless the Father draws him? God is drawing people all the time. We just need to be connecting with people as God is working in their heart because God is working throughout the whole process, not just when somebody's planting, not just when somebody's watering, but before and after and in between. God is always working in people's lives. The Father draws them. When I was a kid, we had a pool, and we had one of those great big bug zappers. I mean, this thing was huge, you know, with the black lights in it, and, he's, and especially at night. You know, here in New England, the state birds, the mosquito, right? And so you, know, you can't go swimming at night. You're going you're gonna to be drained of blood within 10 minutes. And, and, you know, we had that big bug zapper. You'd plug it in, and you sit there lounging in the pool, and you hear, dzz, 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 dzz. And I'm like, oh, man, they're being drawn. They can't resist that. They're like, what is the light? Fly to the light, fly to the light. Bzz, you know, and then they're gone. And then every now and then you get a good juicy moth. Bzz, and you're like, yeah, go, baby, you know? Yeah. And then if you're adventurous like me, the next morning you go out, and there was jimmies for your ice cream all on the ground. You're like, Oh, that's, that's horrible. That's wrong. No one, no one can come, to the, can come to me unless the Father, unless the Father is drawing them. Look at this scripture, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And that word in the Greek, again, doesn't mean that we mentally, humanly, logically reason with people. It's something more than that. It's a divine persuasion. It's something that God is doing. Truth reaches out to truth. Deep reaches out to deep. You are never the one that's responsible to persuade or convince or argue somebody into believing. I've seen some people teach evangelism and they're like, man, you get them into a corner and you stand there and you just beat them up and you don't let them go until they say, I accept Jesus. And they walk away and they didn't accept Jesus. Not in their heart. They just did it with their head to get rid of you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so they get inoculated with just enough Jesus to prevent them from catching the real thing. 
And so we don't want to just beat people up. No, no, we want to let God work in their hearts. We're not responsible. You've got to believe that God is working in people's lives or you'll never, ever share your faith. You'll be too intimidated. But when you understand the truth of what Scripture's teaching here, that God is always actively working in people's lives, then you can share the message with confidence. And you know what? If people push back, I'm not into arguing. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to fight. It's cool. Hey, people have got a free choice, right? Right. I don't want to believe in Jesus. Dude, I'm down with that. That's cool. But as I keep sowing seed, eventually I'm going to run into people where God is working in their lives simultaneously as I'm sowing something into their heart, and there's going to be a harvest. There's going to be a connection that's made. So you don't have to know everything. Like, where did Cain get his wife? seriously you know i wasn't back there six thousand years ago in the garden i don't know and i really don't care well if god is god can he make a rock so big that he can't lift it you know come on right you know what i mean like i don't care if he could i hope he drops it on your head you know i mean just <laughs> that's not what it's about you know what it's about this is what it's about i once was blind and now i see that's it that's what it's about Jesus loves you. And you know, I'm not going to fight about it. I'm not going to argue about it. You've got to believe that God is working in the lives of people. And that it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. It's about the message. See, people are drowning. And when they're drowning, I want to be able to have something that I can throw them. You know, I, was, uh, I, I used to be a licensed scuba diver. I haven't dove in so long that I'm sure my license expired. But years ago, I used to be a licensed scuba diver. And in scuba diving, they would teach you some water safety and some you know, basic water um, uh, rescue and, and you know, life-saving and things like that. And you know what the one thing you don't do when somebody's drowning? You don't swim out to where they are. If somebody's drowning, they will grab whatever they can get their hands on and they will push it down so they can go up. And if it's you, they will drown you. And that's why, you know, people, well, I want to go, I, you know, I, I want to go to the bars and save the alcoholics because I used to be an alcoholic. And I don't have to do that. I can give them the message and let them wrestle with that. I'm not going to allow them to put tentacles around my life and pull me down. I can't do that, and you can't do that either. What did Peter say when they saw the lame man? They didn't say, dude, we're going to buy you a wheelchair. We're going to push you around. We're going to get you Section 8 houses. They didn't. They said, gold and silver, we don't have. But what we have, we give you in the name of Jesus. And Jesus showed up. They didn't give them a messenger. They gave him a message. And the power is in the message. You've got to believe that God is working in the lives of people. Look at this scripture, Acts 16. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God in the sense of Judaism, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things that were spoken of by Paul. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Paul. The Lord was working on her heart. The Lord opened her heart. You can no more reason somebody into salvation than you can fly with your arms to the moon you can't do it it's a spiritual thing it's a supernatural thing unless the father draws them and so here's the thing we're going to have this friend day right september 30th how exciting (laughs) yeah you yeah and you're all going to invite people i've got my guests i've got my guests in the first service dr Jeannie richards superintendent of schools of the raymond school district is my guest for first service Second service, Craig Wheeler, town manager of the town of Raymond. He's my guest for a second. I've got my guests coming. I've got my guests coming. You have to have your guests come. I'm not done. I'm going to get some more, too. I've got my guests coming. They have agreed. I've got emails. I'll read them sometimes in a couple of weeks. I've got emails saying, Ken, we would love to be your friend on your friend day. And I felt special. Because <laughs> on, my, on my list of friends, I have two <laughs> that they're coming. Last week we talked about, actually last week at the end of that message, I prayed a prayer challenging you to dare to make yourself willing to be used of God. you remember that, those of you that were here? This week we passed these out. Did everybody get one of these? If you didn't get one of these, you can get one as you're exiting right on that little 
cafe table right out there. And this is my morning prayer. This is what I want you to do. I want you, starting tomorrow and every day, begin to pray this prayer. Basically, it just says I'm making myself available, my love, my heart, my talents, my energy, my creativity, my faithfulness, my resources, and my gratitude that I'm going to show up for you, God, in whatever way you need me to. And I want you to pray this prayer every morning. This is called my morning prayer. And you can even sign it right there. I'm going to sign this, Lord, and I'm going to pray this every day. That's not really hard to do, is it? That's not, that's not really big. I just want you to do that. Every one of you got one every morning. I want Because our motto is what? Our vision is welcoming people to experience new life through Jesus Christ. I firmly believe in my gut that people are better off with Jesus. That men make better husbands with Jesus. That women make better wives with Jesus. That kids make better kids and parents are better parents and employees and employers are all better. That people are just better with Jesus in their life. And so I want you to pray this prayer every single day. And then remember, next Sunday, next Sunday we have Jason Cooper with us, and that guy just flows in the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not going to want to miss that. One last scripture, and then we're done. Look at this scripture, Colossians 4. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders. He's talking about people that are outside the faith. Making the most of every opportunity. You see, every day, Every week, God is supernaturally giving you opportunities. The thing is, is you may be desensitized to them. You may have already self-talked your way out of being involved in that. But it doesn't mean that God stopped. He's always giving you opportunities. And what Paul is praying here is he's saying, listen, I want you to make the most of every opportunity that I give you. Strike while the iron is hot. And remember that I am working in that situation, and it's not about you. It's about the message. So you don't have to get all hung up about being a great big neon billboard, because it's not about you. It's about the message. Make the most of every opportunity. Here's the cool thing. In the Chinese alphabet, there are characters for words. And in the Chinese Mandarin language, the character for crisis is both danger and opportunity. So when you meet people in crisis, they're going through a relationship crisis, maybe facing a divorce or whatever it might be. You meet people in crisis, maybe they're getting a pink slip, they're getting laid off, maybe they can't make their bills at the end of the month, they're in crisis. It's either a real danger if they don't know Jesus, but it's always, always, always with God an opportunity. And he's saying here, make the most of every opportunity that God gives you. I want you to just close your eyes this morning and just bow your heads for a second. Because I would be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity today. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You know what you've heard today is just a message. It ain't about me. It's not about New Life Church. It's not about these wonderful people or this awesomely talented worship team. It's not about none of that. It's about a message that Jesus crossed the span of time and eternity to come into this world as a human being to die for your sin in your place. And he said, now all you have to do is believe that and receive that and I will forgive you and I will live in you and I will be your God, and I will give you eternal life in heaven for believing in me. That's the good news. And I just want to draw in that net this morning. If you're here today, you've never done that. You've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And you're saying, Pastor, after hearing about hell and the grace of God and guilt and the love of God... I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. You've never done this before. You don't have to be ashamed. No one's looking around. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, you say, Pastor Ken, would you pray for me? I would like to become a Christ follower. I'd like to ask him into my heart right now. If that's you, would you just raise your hand where I can see it? I'm going to pray for you this morning. Is there one this morning you'd raise your hand and say, Pastor Ken, pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be a follower of him. And I want to know that when these eyes dim and when I leave this life, I'm welcomed into his eternal home. Is there one this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Okay, okay. Let's all stand together. There's one last thing. There's one last thing I'm going to ask you to do today. We believe and we trust that God is working in the lives of people, right? God is always working in the lives of people. But one of the ways that he really, 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 really does that is when we pray for them. When we invite him and give him a legal right to come into somebody's life and begin to move on their heart and begin to convict them. He always goes before the planter and the waterer. He's always moving in their life, and it's a response to prayer. So what I'm going to do before we close, as we're closing, all across the front of this platform are post-it notes. I'm going to give you some quick instructions, okay? Just pay attention. Yellow post-it notes are for friends, classmates, coworkers, whatever. Blue post-it notes are for immediate family. I'm going to ask you to come forward as we close this service. Write the first name. I don't need name, address, email. Just, just the first name. Bill, okay? Joe, Mary, whatever. And take it and walk back on the sides of the church and start posting them, not on the acoustical panels, but all around the acoustical panels. And every Sunday, from now until September 30th, we're going to pray. We're going to take a moment in every church service, and we're going to pray for all of these people that we're posting up there. I'm going to ask you to come and write one name and take it. Not, don't sit there and write 30 names and hold up a line. Just write one name. If you want to come back and get back in line and write another one, you can do that as much as you want. You can stay here till second service. I don't care. All right? But this is what I want you to do. I'm so glad that Mike and Lalia are here. Lalia's daughter, Nikki, has been in a fight of her life over breast cancer. Does she have a double mastectomy? She had a double? She's going to have a double mastectomy. They're treating her with you know, the, 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 the latest and the greatest, everything they've got. But she is in a real battle. And, and Sunday here, we, we got a prayer shawl, and we all wrote with markers on it saying, we love you, we're praying for you. We wrote scriptures, things like that. And she sent, she sent a letter back to Sunday, actually to the church, a letter of thanks. And at the end of it, I want you to listen to this. This is a girl whose life And at the end of her letter, she said, cancer is easy. Salvation for the lost is the real battle. Salvation for the lost is the real battle. I once heard a sermon that said this, there's only one thing worse than going to hell, and that's taking somebody else with you. And as believers, we have the privilege of influencing and taking other people with us to heaven because Jesus loves the world. Whoever, the invitation, whoever. Muslims call on the name of Jesus, they're saved. Buddhists, paganists, rapists, murderers call on the name of Jesus and they can find grace and forgiveness. Your family, your co-workers, your classmates can find salvation in the name of Jesus. And so I'm just going to ask you, we're just, I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and as soon as I say amen, you just make your ways. There's tons of stations. They start all the way over there. There's Sharpies right there too. Go all the way around. Just write the name of somebody, plaster on the wall, okay? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you are all about people. You created us in your image. You love us with an undying love. We have sinned and wounded and grieved your heart. We have offended your holiness. And yet even in that, while we were enemies, while we were helpless, while we were sinners, Jesus came to die for the ungodly. And Lord, this morning, your church needs to be reminded that we are about one thing. It's not air-conditioned buildings. It's not programs. It's about the lost. We are in the business of sharing a message with people. And if they dismiss it, that's their choice. But we know that you're working in their lives. And Father, we are asking for an increase in this church of people who we're going to be praying for, that you would begin to, by your Spirit, draw them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray, and everyone said, amen and amen.